Welcome to the first episode of the Trading Bell in the festive season. Well, December is here with us and the holidays are just around the corner. Our first guest for this month is Dr. James Moria, the Group CEO of Centum Investments Limited. The firm just released their financial results, posting 6.8 billion shillings in profits against some significant economic headwinds that the country has continued to witness. But really, who is James Moria? Let's now take a look at his profile. Dr. Moria is the Group Chief Executive Officer and the Managing Director of Centum Investment Company, a position he has held since October 2008. Dr. Moria serves on several boards, including those of Cedian Bank Limited and Almasi Beverages Limited, where he served as Chairman, Nairobi Bottlers Limited, Isuzu East Africa Limited, and Lewa Wildlife Conservancy. Dr. Moria also serves as a director of Centum Exotics Limited, Investpool Holdings Limited, Centum Development Company Limited, and Two Rivers Lifestyle Center Limited. Dr. Moria was also appointed as the Chancellor of Machakos University in October 2016. Dr. Moria holds a Bachelor of Law degree from the University of Nairobi and a doctorate in business from Machakos University. He is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, a CFA charter holder, a chartered global management accountant, a fellow of the Kenya Institute of Management, and a member of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Kenya. Thank you, James. Thank you, B. Pleasure to have you on the, the show. Pleasure is all mine, Abi. Yeah. All right, uh, James. You see a lot of investments coming in into Africa. Mm. At the same time, we are seeing many of the listed companies at the stock exchange having a difficult run. Yeah. We've seen a number of them issuing profit warnings yes. throughout 2019. Mm. And of course, uh, the economy hasn't been performing as to the optimum as uh, was projected by different quarters, be it the central bank, be it the IMF. There's some sluggishness in the economy. But for Centrum, you've managed to post a profit after tax of about 6.8 billion shillings. What's the secret? Yeah, I think, uh, thank, thank you, Abby, for that uh, question. Um, I, I, I think for us, it's in, in each of our pillars, it's having a very clear strategy and investment thesis when you're going in that is largely independent of economic conditions but largely driven by factors within your own control. So one of the case studies I looked at was Almasi, for example. This is a company we came in in 2012, or rather we completed the consolidation in 2012. Correct. If you look at the sources of value, so we, we put in, we, our value at the time was 1.5, we've invested 1.8 billion, so it's cumulatively 3.3 billion mm -hmm. uh, investment. But we've exited at about 11, 12 billion. So if you look at the sources of that value uplift, uh, about uh, out of the 9 billion, 60% of it, half of it, is because of enhancement in the margin, mm -hmm. looking at efficiencies looking at areas where we could do the business better. The other half is because of those efficiency improvements led to better profit margins, which better to led to better return on invested capital, which led us to moving the, the, the exit margin mm -hmm. multiple. So we moved, we, we got in at five times earnings, five times EBITDA, mm -hmm. we left at 10 and a half times EBITDA. Mm -hmm. If you look at the component that has been contributed by growth in revenue, it is less than 10%. So, and that's what really informs our investment and exit dis decisions. It's because you have a very, you have a strategy, a plan with mm -hmm. a finite window. Mm -hmm. Once you get to the end, then there's no further value for you to create because the only way you can sustain that return mm -hmm. is that you must be doing, you must be getting your return from sources other than the market. Sure. And once you get there, then you exit. So that now multiplied across a range of sectors is what will see you continue to perform well. But this particular year, we had uh, a sizable exit. That, that obviously made a, a large contribution. Mm -hmm. But as I said in the investor briefing, it's not something you can expect next year. Mm -hmm. So I think also to moderate uh, expectations is that uh, we may not necessarily deliver six billion next year because we don't have another uh, exit of a, similar, of a similar amount in the coming year. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Moria, 
I'd like you to just break it down for us, especially the composition of the profits and uh, looking at uh, the big picture in terms of um, the various portfolios that you handle. Um, how would you rate your performance? Is, is it uh, a figure you had expected or are you within uh, the margins? I think, you know, for me as a CEO, what I really focus on internally is not just the reported numbers, it's are we achieving real growth on net asset value per share and is each business performing as per the business plan? The numbers are the consequence. So if I look at each of our businesses, if I look at the private equity business, I think we are largely on plan. Mm -hmm. uh, on the overall portfolio, we are, we are at about a 26% IRR. Uh, we are now looking at a new window of, of opportunities. If I look at the real estate portfolio, again, we are largely on plan. Uh, we adopted a market-led development model. On our infield developments, we are currently working on about 1,300 units. We sold 62% of those. Mm -hmm. uh, we are making, I think we could have done better on land sales. Although we have a strong pipeline, about 13 billion, so yeah. looking to close a bit more of those. Mm -hmm. On development, I think we are behind plan. Um, Reasons, you know, like Amu Power, mm -hmm. that's one of them. We've had to impair. These are assets that we should be, by now, realizing. By now, we should have, yeah. Mm -hmm. By now, we should be. They should be on the exit. They should have been on the exit path, path not the impairment uh, path. Yeah. So I think that segment of our business, <coughs> particularly the power portfolio, has underperformed. And uh, there have been lessons for us uh, that we've taken on board. And uh, that's why if you look at our center 4.0, we made a deliberate decision that besides completing these new development projects, we're not getting into any more new projects. Because mm -hmm. what we've learned is that it takes a lot longer and there are a lot of factors that are not in your control. And the businesses that make sense for us are the ones where the key value drivers are in your control. Mm -hmm. Here the key value drivers, many of them are not in your control. So that was for us was a, was a lesson learned. Okay. Uh, so that, that segment of the business is not done as well. Mm -hmm. The marketable securities business, you can only do as well as the market is doing. But under the circumstances, we've uh, shifted from equities to more uh, fixed income securities to optimize current income because uh, Markets are largely depressed, and even if you invest, there's no assurance you'll get a capital gain mm -hmm. on, uh, on, 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 on listed equities. Okay. Yeah. Of course, I'll, I'll take you on further on that, uh, but before I do that, I'd like to reverse a bit and look at the real estate portfolio. Uh, you're talking about a 62% uh, uptake in the market, and um, of course, uh, the real estate has also been a bit... Uh, sluggish, if you ask me, because a number of factors, of course, one of them being the rate cap, Perhaps how severe did the rate cap play a part, especially in the real estate uh, uptick? Yeah, I think when you look at the Centum real estate portfolio, you know, when people talk about real estate, mm -hmm. generally they're talking about real estate in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at the Centum real estate portfolio, it's very diversified. Yeah. We are talking of Uganda, the coast, mm -hmm. uh, and, Nairobi. and Nairobi. So if you look at Uganda, at uh, Vipingo, 98% of everything under development has been sold. If you go to Vipingo, it's almost 70%. No, not Vipingo, sorry, Uganda. Mm -hmm. if you come that to is Marina. Marina. If you come to Two Rivers, mm -hmm. it's about 33%. Mm -hmm. So I think the diversification element of it has also been hugely helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, As opposed to centering everything. In Nairobi. Yeah. Uh, then you'd really be hit hard. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the other thing that has been helpful is the fact that we've also made mistakes in the course of our real estate journey, mm -hmm. but we are now really focused on doing only market-oriented development. So where we start off, what can what can the market afford, mm -hmm. and work backwards. So in Vipingo, one of the first products we introduced at the apartments, which were two million, but that was a hard task to do to get the price to that level. Sure, but it's really to to respond to the market. If the market was stronger, would probably now not be at on one thousand three hundred. Maybe mm -hmm. would have been on three thousand. Uh, but I think what one has to do as a business person is to make the most out of every market situation. Because even in this market situation, people are still buying. Mm. People still have a need. So the question you have to ask yourself, how much of that market share am I going to get? You know, you want to do the best in that particular situation. Mm -hmm. So I think 
I think the team there has done the best in in the situation that that we are in. All right. Yeah. And uh, Moria, looking at uh, real estate, uh, the government has the affordable housing yeah. agenda, and uh, one of the big uh, conversations right now with the PS uh, Charles Hinga is they want to get the private sector on board because government is not in the business of building houses. From where you sit, what sort of opportunity does this present? Yeah. So we're doing a lot of work with the, with the government, uh, with PS Charles Singh and his, and his team. Mm. And he's done a wonderful job. If you look at this current Finance Act, there were a number of incentives that have come in place for developers who are developing yeah. affordable housing affordable houses, mm -hmm. um, whether or not they're on government land. And that is going to reduce the cost considerably, and we welcome that move. There are also opportunities for government to partner even with private developers, and uh, those are ongoing discussions we're having. Government has also come up with sites that they're engaging investors. Again, we're engaging with them on that. So we are we're really engaging activity, and I would like to see us doing a lot more with to support that particular uh, agenda. Any specifics? So we have, we may be launching um, a project in the next uh, couple of months or weeks, and it's a very exciting one, but I think it will be premature uh, to speak about it at this stage. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And Amora, uh, both you and I do agree that, uh, uh, of course, land and real estate are some of the best performing asset classes in, in Kenya's economy. But uh, on the flip side, we've also seen um, a big challenge when it comes to the government's plan, especially the housing levy, which, of course, at the moment is still in court. But the bigger picture is the government is hoping to do the tenant purchase agreement yes. model. Uh, w what are your sentiments around this? I think it's a good thing. You know, the, obviously the challenge now with the housing levy is... Okay, the pros of it is that what the government was going to be able to do is to give a guarantee to offtake from developers. They're going to use a housing levy. But now they've been quite clear with the developers that until that is in place, they cannot offer that. So you still have to be, to do your homework as a developer, that there'll be offtake. But they've given a number of incentives, which is going to reduce the cost mm -hmm. of the eventual build, mm -hmm. which I like. Because you don't want to be totally reliant on government as your off-taker. You want to know that there are real customers who need uh, your product. Mm -hmm. The challenge is obviously they have run into the housing levy is that it's going to reduce disposable incomes. And not necessarily everybody mm -hmm. uh, is going to participate in the affordable housing, housing program. And so from an employee perspective, they feel if I'm not going to participate but I'm making a contribution, then that's unfair and already cost of living is high mm -hmm. and uh, our incomes are coming down. From That's not guaranteed. Yeah, from an employer perspective, mm -hmm. they're thinking, okay, now my take-home pay for workers is going to reduce employees. I may have to top it up, so it increases cost of doing business. So there's a, there are pros and um, there are pros and cons, mm -hmm. uh, but the matter has been stayed by the court. But I believe in uh, focusing on your circle of influence, mm -hmm. not too much being fixated on what has not come through. Mm -hmm. Why don't we work with what you have and uh, making the most out of it? All right. Yeah. Let me take you back to the issue around uh, AMU. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, this is a very grand project for Centum and of yeah. course... Uh, for the country. For the country. <laughs> yeah. uh, when we look at the power needs, yeah. we're, we're talking ab about a plant able to generate over a thousand plus megawatts. Yeah. And uh, of course, Kenya is uh, currently facing serious challenges when it comes to the industrialization mm. uh, agenda and the roadmap. Yeah. For AMU, what next? Look, you know, as we've all learned, these projects take time. Mm. You know, we came in in good faith as investors to support government agenda. AMU was not our project. AMU is a, was a government project mm -hmm. where government went for tender mm -hmm. for under the PPP Act, and we gave the most competitive bid. We've spent a considerable sum of money developing it. We've obviously run into challenges that we did not anticipate because also the mood of the world on matters coal has changed considerably from mm. 2014 to 2019 when we where we are today is it still a viable project i think look 
commercialities, uh, technicalities. Mm. Um, can we get financial close? Yes, we can. Uh, but you need to go through the hurdles that, mm. are, that are there or see the extent to which you can reconfigure it. Uh, does the country need the power? Yes, it does. So for me, I see it as any other... Look, I, li I live in the world of challenges and coming up with solutions and, sure. and being resilient. And uh, so we'll just carry on and mm. uh, take it to its logical uh, conclusion. And yeah. of course, uh, Moria, uh, General Electric did mention that uh, the facility will have the modern yeah. coal technology yeah. that... Yeah. Of course, many many people perceive yeah. coal to be dirty, dirty, and all that yeah. kind of thing. Perhaps, do you have any, anything to say around that? Look, Abi, I think we did everything a developer could do mm. to to reduce the environmental footprint. We've done everything a developer could do to reduce the environmental footprint of that of that project. Uh, there are obviously now broader considerations. Global trends are changing. Mm. So the project has been affected by that. And I think that is uh, part of the risk we as investors take. You know, when you are talking over 30, 40 percent IRR, you don't, it's not risk free. There, there are risks and some of these risks are beyond your control. Some mean you delay. Mm. Uh, but sort of we'll continue to deal with it and see how to eventually get something that works for everybody. So yeah. does this mean uh, you are contemplating an, another exit? Look, you can't exit because uh, the project is not progressing. Mm. You assets that you're able to exit are very good assets. The mm. assets where somebody can see a future uh, return and and so and and when people talk about our exits, we've been, I think, on that area we've done very well because many investors struggle with. I totally agree with with inability to exit. In yeah. fact, it's the biggest challenge for private equity in sure. this country. Sure. So. When you're able to exit an asset, that is the ultimate definition of success as an investor, that I was able to come in, create value, and sell profitably. Mm. So, Amu, you can't exit. That's how we've impaired it. If mm. we could exit, we would have exited. Sure. Uh, but the opposite of exit is impairment. Mm. So, where there's a profit, there's also a loss. So, <laughs> so you, take, you take it on the chin and you, you move on. That's why you have a, you have a portfolio. That's it. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. And uh, Mori, as we wrap up, yeah. what's the pipeline looking like in terms of uh, projects in 2020 ahead of, uh, of course, elections? No, the pipeline is good, Abby. You know, you know we've never struggled for pipeline. Mm. Uh, our challenge has been, in the past, has been capital to deploy. It's never been a pipeline issue. We now have capital in an environment where there's scarcity of capital and where companies are in need of equity. So I think we are very fortunate in that in that regard. Mm -hmm. So um, you know we have a strong pipeline, whether whether it is in uh, in equities, in, in in real estate, and I think the nation has seen the kind of transactions we've done. We've, we've done bold transactions. Many have worked. Actually, in the last ten years, only three have not worked. Out of the many that we've done, that is RVR, which we exited. Mm. In 2009, uh, we took a hit of one and a half million dollars. Recently, King Beverage mm. and Amu Power, only three. Mm. Uh, so, you know, pipeline is not a constraint. Uh, the discipline is there. So, I see us, um, no, I, 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 you know, I see us doing, I see the team doing well on the private equity side, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what's your message to investors? And uh, of course, uh, if you could also share with us uh, expectations around the dividend. We have a dividend policy. You know, for a long time we had a zero dividend policy. Mm -hmm. We then came out and said, we, look, we, we need to give our investors a dividend. And so right now, uh, our policy is to pay the higher of previous year's dividend or 40% of recurrent cash income. Uh, right now, the mm -hmm. previous year's dividend is higher than our recurrent cash income. And that is recurrent cash income excludes capital gains. Mm -hmm. So we don't pay dividend from capital gains. We pay dividend from interest income, yeah. dividend income, recurrent income, so that you can sustain it. Yeah. So right now we are around one shilling and 20 cents, which translates to 800 million shillings per, per year. Mm. I see us maintaining that uh, comfortably. 
as we work on building our recurrent uh, income base to then grow the, the dividend stream. Uh, from a, a shareholder perspective, this huge uh, value gap mm -hmm. between the share price and the NAV, even after impairing assets like AMU. So AMU is not on the balance sheet. But the NAV per share is still 75 shillings. And we did analysis that showed that today we have about 5 shillings of uh, cash per share mm -hmm. in our books. We have a PE portfolio which is about 14 bob. So the differential is real estate and development. And that has been, the market is carrying it at 30% of, of the value. So it presents significant uh, upside for, for investors. I think my general message to investors generally, not just uh, investors and business people in, within Centum, is really in every opportunity, in every situation there's an opportunity for you as a business. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I would urge all of us to focus on what is in our circle of influence, what we can do to take advantage of the opportunities no matter how limited they are within our that are within our circle of, of influence. Because even in this environment, there are opportunities. And the question is, how do you, what strategy do you use within your own business to harness whatever opportunities there are? Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Mora, it would be unfair for me to end this interview without getting your views on, uh, of course, uh, the political situation in the country, yeah. where we have uh, the Building Bridges Initiative. Yeah and the report has been tabled yeah. and there's now the public discussion out yeah. there and of course we cannot divorce the economy, the economy yeah. from the economy yeah uh, and you wear several hats over and above uh, being the group ceo yeah. at centum yeah i just want to to get your your parting shot on this yeah you know the political leadership drives the economic direction of the country not the other way around it's the politics that drives the economy and i think if we can have a situation where we have stability in the politics mm -hmm. and uh, predictability in the politics, then you'll have a more uh, stable uh, economic environment. I think the, the current planning cycle, which is five years around elections, is too costly for the economy. It creates a very uncertain uh, investment environment. And so any initiative that takes away that uh, political risk out of the equation, I think can only be welcomed. So my hope is that that the direction will end up where elections are normal uh, occurrences mm. and we don't start saying, oh, now we're going to another election year. Because then you find yourself operating on a three-year cycle. Because the, the, you lose the year after the election, you lose the year before the election. So mm. you're operating on a three-year cycle. Mm -hmm. And that's a very short cycle to make any kind of plans or any kind of uh, investment decision. You, you know, today... The biggest challenge we are facing is you have a huge youth population. I'm the chancellor of a university and, and I preside over the graduation. This year was 1,800 in my university alone. Mm. And what my heart goes out to, what are we doing to create jobs for these young people who are coming out of, uh, out of university? And you cannot create jobs in an uncertain environment. You need certainty so that investors can come in, take a 20 year view on this economy, put in money, and, 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 and create jobs. And I think that whatever we do, it's important to remember that we have many young people who are relying on us as leaders to take the right decisions so that then they're also able to have a better future and to provide for their families than we have done. And those, that's a constituency we always have to, to think about and what is right uh, for them so that the country we leave behind is a far better country than what we found, mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect, perfect points, Moria. And lastly, of course, the rate cap. Yeah. Some say it will spur economic growth. Some say it will open up access uh, of credit to SMEs. From where you sit at a vantage point, mm. was it the right move to take? No, it's the right move. And I think it was the wrong move even to put it in the first place. You see, mm. what, what rate caps did is that the segment of the population that has taken the biggest plant are SMEs. Mm -hmm. The large corporates have continued to access credit normally. They were accessing credit below 13% before the rate cap. They continue to access credit. Look at us. We, we, we raised a bond in 2012 
at 13 percent we raised the second bond in 2015 at 13 percent so nothing changed with or without the rate cap mm. but the sme uh, if you're running a small business the bank needs to be able to price risk now if your risk is above that 13 percent they could not lend to you they would rather lend to government that's why you see the liquidity of banks has gone up considerably and the expansion of the private sector credit growth has come down mm -hmm. so and that sort of chokes liquidity uh, you have an lpo from your client you need to pay your vendors you need to get an overdraft you can't access it mm. so it means that you cannot do the business the person you'd have employed you cannot employ them your supplier your cameraman has no job that is the that is the implication so my hope i think the removal is good uh, it will uh, and it will also lead to the right decisions because once you remove the right cap then you also see the true cost of credit even to government because if the true cost of credit was then reflected earlier some of the decisions that were taken around borrowing domestically mm -hmm. may have been different because the party that was subsidized the most uh, with the rate cap is government of kenya that was able to access credit a lot more cheaply and therefore some of the investment decisions that they took probably would have been different if they were carrying the, re the real cost of uh, of, uh, of capital. So the problem with these caps is that they distort market incentives mm -hmm. and they distort the market uh, the market structure. Yeah. Wow, I had to take a gulp. Very deep insights. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Abby. Dr. James Moria. Fantastic. Such Thanks a pleasure a to have you on the, the show. Pleasure mine, yeah? And we look forward to 2020. Let's see. Let's carry on, yeah? All right. Yeah, thanks a lot, Abby. Yeah. Well, we've been speaking there exclusively to James Moria, who is the CEO of Centum Investments. And he's quite optimistic that um, the economy is headed in the right direction, especially with the rate cap being lifted. And there's a lot to expect also from Centum as a company. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's episode of The Trading Bell. Feel free to engage with us on our social media platforms appearing at the bottom end of the screen. Remember, you can also tweet me at Agina Abi. Remember as well to follow us on social media as well. Well, that's all we had time for. See you next time. Have a nice weekend.